Hello, welcome to Let's Browse number two. I'm your host, Max, and uh, today we're going to be browsing a little bit differently from how we were browsing yesterday. So one of the things, uh, one of the pieces of feedback that I got back <laughs> from my friend Ben was that he felt the show was a little too self-aware at the beginning. And that's something I'm inclined to agree with. But he also felt that the second half of the show was better than the first half. And uh, I think the reason for that is I might have been a little bit too negative yesterday. I actually like all those websites uh, I visited, uh, including Reddit, which is pretty good, even though I think parts of it are not so great. Uh, there's definitely some communities on there that I don't really enjoy. So today I thought that it would be interesting to try a different experiment, to try and pre-browse uh, some of the things that I looked at, um, and then sort of line these up so it'd be a little bit more like a guided tour in freeform browsing, which I know is not quite in the spirit of Let's Browse, but let's pretend it's like I played a game already and I'm taking you through a tour of like a level of the game that I've already played. Uh, so one of the things that I investigated was Delicious, which is a uh, web service that I haven't used for I think almost four years at this point. Um, and I remember that they used to be a pretty good bookmark saving service, where you could go around and just use their little bookmarklet and uh, you know save all these different websites that you looked at. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, you can get all these links if you just go on delicious.com slash Max Geiger. Uh, but I'm going to put these links in the description for the video, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the stuff I've been browsing. Uh, so the first thing is, there's this cool webcomic called Camodad, which I found out about thanks to Casey Green's Twitter. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. This is, this is the comic that he linked with his man, and he's got uh, these chickens that he's feeding, but he's wearing this sweet t-shirt of uh, like an eagle wearing an American like F-15 eagle pilot. Uh, uniform and equipment, which seems pretty cool and kind of self-referential. It's this, uh, you know, eagle dressed as an eagle pilot. Um, and then there are a lot of other ones that are pretty good in here. I guess there's this character, uh, Chad, spelled with a T, who is like Tchaikovsky, is, uh, is the joke that they make, but I'll, I'll let you find that one on your own. Oh, and there's this Dream Genie. That's pretty good, too. Um, and the really cool thing about this is I went ahead and browsed over to the Tumblr of the creator and scrolled down looking around and just trying to follow up on the stuff, and I found this. This is real great. I think we should zoom in on it. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot to start our timer, so let's pretend those first uh, few moments are free. Uh, so this is real great. Apparently, there's a video game called Mushroom Age, and there are many possibilities that can happen in it, including uh, massaging history's own Socrates as he lays naked on a table and offers you encouragement in the form of anecdotes and various noises. A great game indeed. So I thought this was too good to be true, and I had to look it up. Uh, so I did a little uh, Google search for Mushroom Age, and then found some incredible images. I guess it's a hidden object game, and they're pretty good, but I mean, this one's, this one's great right here. Socrates is telling you, woman, what are you doing here? I'm not dressed. And I mean, if anybody's going to complain about that, oh, oh, man, we don't want to go there. Uh, that should be Socrates. Oh, man. So... It looks pretty cool. There's other, there's other cool stuff going on in here. There's like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, I guess. It says, uh, this mouth needs a serious cleaning. That seems like it could be kind of funny. And so I checked it out, and uh, BigFishGames.com has this game available for $2.99 right now. If you use the coupon, new $2.99. Uh, normally it's 10 bucks, which I think is a bargain for any game that lets you massage Socrates and party with Einstein. Um, sorry, Professor Einbach the director of this laboratory, not Einstein, even though pretty clearly he's probably infringing on Einstein's image rights. Um, another cool thing, I think I got this link off of Twitter as well, is uh, it's called Born Slippy in the Making of Star Fox. Uh, it's a Eurogamer article by Damien McFerrin, and it talks about how it's uh, been like the 20th anniversary of Star Fox this month. I don't know, maybe if it's turn 20 just yet, or if it just turned 20. But it talks about the development of Star Fox, which I remember being a really good game for the SNES, and a little bit about what happened to the development team, and uh, I don't know, let's take a look. Like, uh, you know, some cool stuff, and some stuff that Dylan Cuthbert's been doing. He's a dude behind Q Games, which is a cool company. Uh, definitely check him out if you hadn't heard of him. Um, so yeah, I'm going to look forward to reading this later, but this is a good, this is a good browse find.
Um, next thing I got for you is uh, this video where Dustin Hoffman apparently uh, had a sad experience that many women have when he was uh, trying to get Tootsie made. Mauritius so, girl. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh that's so loud. Um, so Mr. Hoffman decided to do a makeup test to try and convince the studio executives to make the movie. Uh, and they made him look, you know, as much like a woman as they could. And then he said, what's, what's the matter, guys? I want to be a really pretty woman. And they said, well, that's it. That's as good as you get. It. And then Dustin Hoffman realized, oh, I hate it when websites do this. This is really terrible. I just wish everyone would stop these pop-ups that show up on top of websites. They really just ruin your browsing experience. And it's, it's usually that you can just press escape and get out of one of these. But this one, you actually have to click on it. It's not going to show us that again. But apparently, uh, so the makeup team made Dustin Hoffman into a lady, and uh, he didn't think he was the most attractive lady he could be, and he wanted to look better, but what they told him was that that's as good as it got, and then he realized that that's a bummer for many, many women, um, and that he is an interesting person who is not necessarily an attractive woman, and that there must be lots of women who feel like they should be more attractive, who are interesting people, who we probably discount in society. And then I guess he went home and he cried. And I think he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, I had a tweet a while back about how I wish I could uh, videotape Dustin Hoffman doing skateboard tricks uh, in his backyard. We'd call that movie The Graduate. I think it'd be pretty good. I'm still not over that joke yet. Um, so it's a good one. Uh, you should definitely check it out because he tells the story a lot better than I did. Um, and then going along with that, there's like a, there are a fair number of people in like my Facebook feed and on Twitter who I follow who are interested in issues of gender. Um, I thought this was a very interesting article. It's about the danger in demonizing male sexuality. Uh, and it's talking about some problems of how there's this predator-prey model of sexuality where men are perceived to be predators. Um, and how, you know, some, a lot of culture is to blame for that, but the problems that that causes both for men and women. Um, and it linked to this other pretty good article called Can Men Write About Sex Without Sounding Like Douchebags? Uh, which is pretty good, but it gets into some not safe for work language on the second page. But it's interesting, it talks about how a lot of cisgender men uh, can't necessarily write about sex uh, without sounding like jerks. Uh, most uh, successful male sex writers these days are more on the queer spectrum of things. Um, and, but it does acknowledge that there are a lot of male authors who've written about sex and you know their writing just sort of got thrown into the classic literary canon rather than considered sex writing all on its own. Um, okay, moving on. So, the uh, Molyneux, Molyjam Do uh, was a week, two weeks ago, uh, and there's a pretty good article on Gama Sutra, which is a great place for games news if you want to look it up, uh, by Brendan Sheffield where he sort of talks about what went right and what went wrong. Uh, and then you can go on to www.mollyjam.com slash games, and you can see all the games that these people made uh, celebrating Peter Molyneux quotes. Well, Peter, yeah, I think it was actually Peter Molyneux quotes this time instead of Peter Molyneux. So these are definitely going to be worth a check out, or at least a browse through a little bit later on. I mean, I'm loving a lot of these titles, like Royalty Simulator 2013, Time Code, War Chat, Peter Needs a Pint, Emotion, harassing the city, acorns get, don't mash it, best friend. I mean, these are these are some really great names, and uh, they look like they might be fun games for games that were made in uh, 48 hours. All right. Uh, what else is cool that has happened? Uh, my friend Spencer was on the Indoor Kids, which is a cool podcast run by the Nerdist. Uh, ben, who helped me out by giving me some of those tips uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of the video, Ben and I actually were on an episode of the Indoor Kids on Nerdist podcast, so you can check that out. But I'm going to go ahead and link to this episode with Spencer Crittenden because he talks a lot about dungeon mastering and he's really good at it. And also, he's got a sweet beard and a cool voice. Uh, and then, a little bit, this is Spencer's YouTube channel which you can check out if you want to know a little bit more about the man behind the myth, which is real good. Um, so we'll go ahead and link to that, but Spencer's YouTube channel is Bill Cosby Fan, uh, so I hope that's not too close to internet stalking. Um, and then the next link I have for you guys is the Wikipedia article on Zorro the Gay Blade. Uh, somebody asked me on Twitter who I thought was the deadlier Western vigilante uh, between the Lone Ranger or Zorro. Um, 
And that's not really an interesting question. I mean, I get asked these questions from time to time about who might be deadlier because of what I did on Deadliest Warrior. Um, but I think Zoro has a lot more panache and is a lot more interesting character. And if you haven't seen this movie, this is a really great movie. Well, I don't know if it's really great. I had an amusing time watching it as a kid, and that's kind of a funny farce from uh, 1981 where uh, one actor plays both Zoro and Zoro's gay brother, uh, and then they have all kinds of adventures. And then this bit in here, which I didn't remember from the movie, is so good. It's about all these different California Dons. So there's Don Dan Diego, uh, sorry, Don Diego from San Fernando, Don Francisco from San Jose, Don Fernando from San Diego, Don Jose from San Bernardino, and Don Luis Obispo from Bakersfield. And this, this is a pretty good California joke because these are all Dons with like last names that tie to geographic places, but they're from confusing uh, cities that are not those geographic places. They're not like named after the city that they're from. So I thought that was pretty good. Uh, so definitely check this movie out. It's probably on Netflix at this point. We should have, should have prepped and looked into that. And then here's another article that I thought was pretty good. This is, or actually, I don't know if it's any good, but I'm excited to read it later because it came up in my links. And it's about uh, the video game series No One Lives Forever, which I last remember someone talking about maybe when I was like a freshman in high school. It was a long time ago. Um, but it's talking about how Kate Archer, who's the heroine of this series, is pretty cool and she's gaming's greatest unsung heroine. And I actually think Kirk Hamilton is probably one of Kotaku's better writers. Um, and there, uh, there might be some meat to the story, which is cool. But the other thing that I, uh, has, well, I wanted to play the No One Lives Forever series for one time. I should check it out and see if it's on Steam and actually, you know, not be lazy about it. But I think it's great that there's a 60s spy game that somebody made. And 60s spy stuff is really cool. The only other game that I can really think of that had any sort of, like, 60s jet age swinging mystery spy stuff happening in it was probably uh, Evil Genius, which was a Dungeon Keeper style game where you were the bad guy. Um, but we definitely need more of it. Uh, and it's also kind of funny, I guess, that, you know, the, the heroine in this game is Archer, and then, you know, the, there's a the TV series Archer now with a 60s spy hero. Um, and I guess Rockstar Games uh, released the gameplay trailer for Grand Theft Auto V, and it looks pretty cool. There's a lot of cool stuff in it. They've taken this interesting approach with it where the narrator speaks in like a very flat, almost like a marketing video. Oh my goodness! It's ten minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up as we continue our dismal experiment. But um, one of the cool things about it is that, uh, yeah, they've got this weird marketing speak for presenting all the different gameplay features. So they're talking about how you can like skydive and things like that. But I'm gonna go ahead and play just like three seconds of this. And what I want you to do is I want you to notice all of the characters' hands. This is something that really bothers me about Rockstar games and Grand Theft Auto games in general, which is as you watch the characters, they move with these very exaggerated hand motions. It's almost like they, they added in the finger animation later on. They just had these actors who were mocapping in mittens. But it feels like everyone's just talking very big with their hands, you know, it's like they don't really know what to do with them, so they're always just constantly in motion. And I've got like these weird floating hands. It's like, you know, uh, Ricky Bobby when he doesn't remember what to do with his hands in that movie. I mean, just look, look at all of them, man. Maybe it's a testament to how good their motion capture is that, uh, you know, the hands are constantly moving and we just don't really, our hands in real life are constantly moving and we just don't really notice it, but here it's pretty exaggerated because of the model in the game that they put on top of it. And then the final article I want to share is, I thought this was pretty cool. Here in L.A., uh, Eric Garcetti was recently elected mayor after a runoff. And I don't know too much about him. I haven't uh, been following the mayoral election too closely, uh, which makes me a terrible person because I give a bunch of people guff about it. Because when you think about how the city of L.A. has, I think it's 3.4 million people in it, and then greater Los Angeles is close to 10 million people in it. You know, we're, we're a pretty significant part of the country. Um, you know, for a while... California was the world's sixth largest economy. Uh, I don't know how we're sitting now since the global crash. I think we might be like seventh or eighth or something like that. But as a primary city with like uh, between a third and a quarter of the state's population located immediately around us, like the mayor of LA is going to be a guy who has a lot of power. 
But I thought this was really cool. Apparently, he made everybody reapply from their job. So he asked them all to resign, and then they've all got to reapply and justify their positions. If you're the head of a, one of the city's 37 departments, and a lot of them make uh, you know uh, pretty good six-figure salaries, you know, like 200,000 and 300,000 um, dollars. And I thought this was cool because there was an episode of The West Wing where uh, when Bartlett got elected to his second term, they talked about how it's traditional for the presidential cabinet to all resign and then they all sort of resubmit or reapply for their jobs or asked to return. Um, and it's just an interesting sort of social thing that when there's a turnover, people voluntarily leave their jobs. Not so voluntarily in this case, but traditionally, at least with that White House thing, people voluntarily leave their jobs and are asked to return. I guess based on how well they did or based on if somebody else is there. Um, I thought that's kind of cool, like, you know, trying to take that strategy and, you know, put a little new blood in there. Um, I definitely don't feel good for uh, somebody who's Gary English. Who is this? Uh, Olga Gary English, head of the Department of Cultural Affairs, who makes $205,647 a year, according to the city documents. Uh, and she left the meeting unsure of what to include when reapplying. There was very little directive, she said, it, so it's a little nerve-wracking. Uh, and I think earlier in this article they justified it by saying that they wanted somebody who had a uh, vision. Oh, here it goes. The overall the message from Garcetti was that general managers should have both vision and accountability uh, as a spokesperson for him. So it seems like uh, you, gotta, you gotta worry about your vision and accountability if you're not really sure how you're gonna reapply to your own job. Um, that might be an interesting exercise. I mean, maybe we should all think about reapplying our own jobs. Anyways, we've gone over time. Uh, we've done our 10 minutes of browsing, and I hope you guys enjoyed today's links. And we'll go ahead and try and get them into the video. And yeah, I think that's just about it. And we'll continue this experiment later on. All right, I'm Max Geiger, and this has been Let's Browse, number two.